Hello everyone again and welcome to the final part of my WWF No Mercy Let's Play series where I am 100%ing the Light Heavyweight Championship. It's been a long, hard road, but we're finally at the end. <clears throat> no, I'm kidding, it hasn't been that hard. Uh, <laughs> it's actually been really fun and I'm very proud that I was able to get through all these Let's Play videos. Um, and it's very exciting to have a complete series of Let's Play videos. And um, at the end of this video, you'll see, I'll show you that from all the different paths that I took, um, I will have 100% on Light Heavyweight Championship. And um, that's all thanks to the facts that, the, the, well, the facts, the FAQ that I use on, from Game Facts um, that you can see in the description below. And um, this is going to be a fun episode because I'm playing as Dean Malenko, who in my opinion should be the most um, decorated or you know, at least recognized as being the greatest light heavyweight champion that WWE ever had. Um, let's forget the Gilbert nonsense, <laughs> even though according to WWF's reign, which I've talked about in the past, or at least the reigns they recognize, uh, Gilbert is technically the longest reigning champion they've had but I'm gonna just block that out of my memory and just say D. Malenko was because he did have the second longest reign uh, he's a two-time light heavyweight champion tied with X-Pac which is the most someone has held the light heavyweight championship again this is all according to you know WWF's um, history of the title because they exclude the you know the the history that it had in the UWA and in um, New Japan and if you don't know what I'm talking about uh, go check out my other videos where I delve into the history of the light heavyweight championship uh, before um, Taka Michinoku won the tournament in the WWF um, it has a long extensive history that history that I detail in my other videos um, but yeah but this is gonna be all about Dean Malenko um, Dean Malenko one of my favorite wrestler, wrestlers of all time um, loved the work he did in WCW um, that's really where I when I got to know him um, and then later on I was able to go back and watch some of the stuff he did in ECW but he's he's done a lot he was the ECW TV champion uh, two times he was a tag team champion in ECW with Chris Benoit he was a uh, US heavyweight champion in WCW uh, tag team champion uh, again with Chris Benoit although very briefly and um, four-time WCW Cruiserweight Champion. Uh, he had uh, four reigns that totaled 188 days, and that makes him the eighth most um, champ. You know, uh, I always, I always have, <laughs> have trouble saying that. He, he's ranked eighth out of the Cruiserweight Champions for most combined days. Yeah, okay, I'm going to go with that. That's going to be the best way I'm going to say that. Um, but he was a two-time light heavyweight championship. Uh, champion he only held that he, that's the only WWE title he held unfortunately but he wasn't really in the WWE that long um, you know Chris Benoit was in WCW for many many years before he finally jumped ship uh, he debuted on Raw January 31st 2000 a Raw I remember very well uh, where him and the other radicals Perry Saturn, Chris Benoit, and Eddie Guerrero, they were in the audience, and it was a huge deal. We all knew they were coming, and they finally came over to WWF, and it was a great moment. Um, and they all did great things in WWE. Um, and that was kind of a big deal for this game, too. Um, you know, like I've said before, and like, like, you know, people probably know, but this game was released in November of 2000. Um, and WrestleMania 2000 was released in October of 99 and uh, you know to, so they came in January so you gotta think that's maybe 10 months before No Mercy came out that's when they debuted on Raw so that's still plenty of time to include them in the game and that was gonna be a big question is are, are these guys gonna be in the next you know WWE game and they were and that was that was really cool because we, you know, when WCW transferred over, or the license from WCW went to WWF uh, for AKI to develop these games, you know, you lost a lot of those WCW superstars. So it was a great to see some of them come back, like D. Malenko, Guerrero, Saturn, and Benoit. And they were pretty similar 
to how they are in revenge. I mean, a lot of them have the, you know, some of the same moves, um, same finishers. Um, D. Malenko actually is very interesting, uh, and and also actually him, Perry Saturn, and Chris Benoit all do this because in No Mercy they introduced the um, submission special. So you can have your regular special, and then when you have your your you know your grapple specials, I mean. And you can have your regular submissions. Like right now, I'm doing his leg move, and it's not the uh, Texas Cloverleaf. Which in Revenge, if you did his leg move, his leg submission, I should say, it was the Texas Cloverleaf. But here in No Mercy, you have to have your special to do it. So, I actually have a playthrough of uh, WCW NWO Revenge, where I do a cruiser rate uh, run with D. Malenko. And... Uh, no commentary because it was one of my earlier videos where I wasn't doing let's play commentary I'll do some later on again. Maybe I'll do another D. Malenko run in in WCW talk about his history there but um, I win every match pretty much with the Texas Cloverleaf because it's really easy to just keep coming back and doing You know that move and that was his finisher. So it's like hey, why not? But here it's a little different so I want to work the leg on, on, on these wrestlers, and you'll see throughout the playthrough, I'll, I'll work the leg. Like right now, Taka's holding his leg, and um, I'm trying to I'm trying to work it enough so that I know when I do the Texas Cloverleaf, uh, I'll make him tap. Now, in in no in Revenge, you always had to worry about even though if you work the guy's leg enough, uh, they didn't tap right away. You still you. You just still had to make sure they didn't get the rope break before they tapped um, Because there was like a set the set amount of pulls I would say that like that's what I would call it pulls like when the animation when like they're pulling back on the leg There was a set amount of pulls before they tapped. once they reached that set amount. That's when they would tap here. It's different um, They'll tap pretty much right away if you've worn their leg down enough and you'll see here with with Taka um, that I'm about I'm about to do that. I'm about to just set him up for his um, his um, Texas Cloverleaf right now. So look, he just falls, which was great. He ran into me. He bumped. So I'm gonna go for the Texas Cloverleaf now. Now I have it. I got the special going, and then we get into the ropes and rope break. Ah, argh, and I'm gonna lose the special now. So that's the only <laughs> frustrating thing about uh, how they change this mechanic is um when you have a wrestler whose finisher um was a submission you got to think a little differently on how you end the match with him uh so his matches might go a little longer because of that some of them go a little bit shorter actually but um and i'm also facing taka in a regular singles match because i'm putting the title on the line so i can do the championship run with d malenko it's the final run i need to do um it's pretty it's gonna be pretty simple I just gotta lose the first match and then win all the other matches and then Dean Malenko will be the light heavyweight champion so yeah he came into Raw with with uh, Perry Saturn Benoit and Getty, and Eddie Guerrero the Radicals um, and he actually won the title pretty quickly after he came to, to, to WWE um, he won it on an episode of Raw in March March 13th by defeating S.A. Rios who I have a Let's play. He's my first let's play of this series, so it's kind of coming full circle in a way. Uh, he held the title for 35 days in that first reign before losing it to Scotty Tuhati on an episode of Raw on April 17th, 2000. Uh, and then a week later on SmackDown, he got it back from Scotty Tuhati. So uh, the, the Radicals were engaged in a feud with Too Cool for much of the time they just came. For, well, I should say in the beginning of their time at WWE, and um, so Dean Malenko and Sky Tuhati kept going back and forth for this light heavyweight title. But once he got that second reign, um, he was champion for pretty much all of 2000, um, and and going into 2001, his second title reign lasted uh, 322 days. So if you combine that with his first reign, um, he was total. Um, he was a champion for a total of 355 days. Uh, still second longest behind Gilbert, but I'm not going to make a call of Gilbert and play as Gilbert. I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> um, 
I, I ignore. Just like WWE wants to ignore um, the UWA title reigns and the New Japan title reigns, I'm going to ignore Gilbert's title reign. So there. Um, um, so he loses the title to Crash Holly, who I also did a light heavyweight run on an episode of Sunday Night Heat in March of uh, 2001. So yeah, he pretty much held it for a year as, t- as champion. And then um, he actually retired from wrestling at the end of 2001. And um, it's kind of a shame. Not really. I mean, Dean Malenko was older. <clears throat> Excuse me. He had a lot of injuries piling up. And um, he retired pretty quickly from when he entered the WWE. Um, so I think he didn't accomplish as much as he did in WCW. But in WCW, he was definitely held back like the other guys. And that's why they finally came over. But um, still... To, to, to just right away throw the title on him and, and bring some a, a little bit of prestige to the light heavyweight title and, and I think that's only why it was able to last as long as it did um, because shortly after they would just retire it for the cruiserweight title and there I go I get tired I'm like you know what I'm just gonna put Taco away because I can't get the rope break you know I can't I can't get him put him away with the submission because I keep rope breaking him and I'm just gonna go ahead and put him away easily but yeah, um, it would have been interesting to see if, if to see what would have happened if these guys came a little bit older earlier. Because I always thought Dean Malenko was a top level player, and in nineteen like in the in like the late nineties he was hot. I mean, like maybe like ninety six, ninety seven. People loved Dean Malenko. I loved him, and you know he had that feud with Chris Jericho. But he was just solid when he came out. He just I remember I was watching um, on the WWE Network old old Nitro episodes. And the cheers for D. Malenko when he came out, when his music hit, people would go nuts for D. Malenko. And I forgot about that. I was like, yeah, D. Malenko was so over back then. And he didn't do anything. He just came out. He, you know, he uh, he warmed up his wrists. He did that little ta- like move where he was like stretching his wrists or whatever the hell he was doing, rubbing his wrists. They put it in revenge. It's hilarious. And... Um, that became his thing. He had, he had simple trunk des- trunks design. Um, he 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 did his promos weren't anything special. He was just a no frills uh, kind of wrestler, all business in the ring. But he was fantastic. He had great matches with the cruiserweight, to, well, all the other cruiserweight weights. But he could hold his own against the heavyweights too because he was such a solid technical wrestler. And I think that's what people love because at the end of the day, yeah, wrestling is entertaining. And wrestling is fun to watch because of the storylines and the gimmicks and the special matches and this and that. At the end of the day, though, a lot of that wrestling, when it comes out, that is what usually holds people's attention. And Di Malenko was one of the best. And I always thought he could have been a world champion in WCW, much like a lot of the other cruiserweights, I mean, even Ray, like Rey Mysterio, Jericho especially, and, and if you saw how they were able to become world champions in the WWE, people wanted that. People wanted to see that. I, I think at the end of the day, it didn't matter what your size was. If you were a great wrestler, um, people wanted to see you win. And I think that's why now we have a lot of the um, smaller guys winning. We have guys like Daniel Bryan um, and even even CM Punk. I mean, he's not that big. He's not he's not a Hogan. He's not a Brock Lesnar. He's not a John Cena. But you know, we we're, we're able to to believe um, that he can beat the guys he goes up against because he he's a good wrestler. And the same thing with Daniel Bryan. I mean, Daniel Bryan, you know, WrestleMania he fought Triple H. Orton and Batista, smallest guy in the room, basically. You know what I mean? And, and and still, because he's just a fantastic wrestler, he's such a fantastic personality. Uh, we buy into that, and we love it. We want to see these guys win. We want to see them go over. And I think that that was the case with Dean Malenko. I mean, he was voted PWI, you know, number one in '97. He was ranked number one in the PWI in 97 and all he really was doing was just winning like the cruiserweight title like you know what i mean like that says something he was very popular um so it's a shame that we only got like a year and a half two years of him in the wwe because he could have done a lot more i think if he came a little bit earlier because wwe definitely wanted to do a lot with these guys and um excuse me and you saw that with 
Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit, you, you saw the, the heights they were able to reach. Uh, Perry Saturn, not so much, but Perry Saturn had a lot of personal issues. Um, so that probably prevented him from climbing the WWE ladder. Um, as did Eddie Guerrero, but Eddie Guerrero was able to overcome it and come back and uh, make an impact. But yeah, so talking about their year in review. Um, see right there, I had to lose to uh, S.A. Rios real quick, I just want to say. And I actually couldn't, he couldn't counter anything. I was trying to get him to counter me, and then eventually he just was countering stuff so much that he was able to build his special meter. So I was like, ah, whatever. <laughs> just let him be me that way. A loss is a loss. So, um, yeah. So now, all these, this whole path is pretty much going to be new, I think. Oh, no, actually, I think this is where you'll get to see um, a repeat. One of the matches will be a repeat from another path. I think I think my match with Jeff Hardy will be a repeat. Because um, like I mentioned, you know, in one of the Let's Play episodes, I mentioned how some of the paths intersect. Um, but, yeah, so anyway. So with my year in review with Dean Malenko, yeah, uh, you know, the first one that's going to be kind of different from all the other guys because they were in WWE at the time, but... Um, in November of 99, he was still in WCW, so he fought on the Mayhem pay-per-view. He was rolling around with the Revolution, interesting en enough, uh, which was him, Saturn, and Shane Douglas. And um, they, they took on the Filthy Animals, which was Eddie Guerrero, Kidman, and, um, and uh, Conan. Uh, but I believe the match was actually a, a, a tag team match between... Um, Saturn, Malenko, and Asia, who was the uh, you know the female member of the Revolution, and um, they took on Guerrero, Kidman, and Tori Wilson um, in like a mixed elimination tag team match, I believe. And uh, but the Revolution won. And then in Starcade '99 in December, uh, the Revolution again teamed up, and this time they took on the Varsity Club, which was an old um, group of wrestlers that kind of reunited for this match. Uh, Shane Douglas, Malenko, Saturn, and Asia. They took on Jim Duggan and the Varsity Club, who was Kevin Sullivan, Mike Rotunda, and Rick Steiner. Um, and they won that one. I think it's because the Varsity Club turned on Jim Duggan. I don't know. I don't remember. It was all fuzzy. L late WCW, I don't remember much of it because there was just so much craziness going on. I do remember the sold-out pay-per-view. WCW sold out 2000 January 16. Billy Kidman beat D Malenko in a very fast match. It had a it had a stupid gimmick. It was like a catch ass catch can match. And basically, if your feet touched the floor outside, you'd lose. And like right away, they're wrestling, and then like D Malenko slides out the ring because he's like gonna catch his breath. And then like uh, like no, remember you can't go outside. You lose. It was stupid. <laughs> But that was his last match in WCW. Um, Perry Saturn also fought that night. And that was his last match. I think he actually fought Kidman too. And Chris Benoit fought last that night. And he won the title from Sid. In a reign... I, I don't know if it is recognized by WCW or not. I mean, I think it is by now. Um, because of WWE. But um, Chris Benoit beat Sid for the title. And uh, it was a very emotional moment because they interviewed him afterwards and he was like crying. He finally won and then boom, he was out. Like the next day he was gone from WCW. He left. It was it was all their last days. Eddie Guerrero was supposed to be on the pay-per-view, but I think word on the street was that he didn't want to do it. So he, he, he didn't show up to the pay-per-view or something like that. Um, but yeah, pretty and we all knew they were coming. Everyone knew they were leaving WCW. Like that was the, that was a big deal. Um, when those four guys were leaving because those were four of the top wrestlers in that company for a long time and yeah they they weren't all world champions in, the, in WCW but everyone knew like they're going to the WWE that's that's gonna, that's big that's a big deal um, they're gonna do a lot of great things there and they did uh, and very quickly they made their debut and um, right away and, and they started feuding with Too Cool pretty much um, and um, and Benoit was definitely the the first guy to break out from the feud with Too Cool. But um, on No Way Out in February, uh, Malenko uh, and the rest of the Radicals took on Rikishi, 
um, Scotty Too Hotty and Grandmaster Sexy. Now they lost. They lost the match. They actually lose all their pay-per-view matches pretty much to Too Cool. All the tag team matches they lose, which I which I thought was funny. Uh, like way to put these guys over. You come in and they make an impact, and then you just have them lose to Too Cool every pay-per-view. It was weird, but um, they would get over it. And here I go. See, I've been working on the leg. Do I do I pull off the clover leaf on this this guy this time? I might, I might, I might do it this time. You know, it's also when you're doing submission holds, it, it's always best to try to remember, um, you know, what foot or what leg you step over with to block yourself on the ropes. And um, since I hadn't played with Di Malenko for a while, um, I, I kept forgetting early on, um, like which way I would step over for the clover leaf, so that because you want that leg. You want his uh, right leg, I believe. You want his right leg to step over, and then you want your the wrestler to move towards that direction, towards the rope, so that you're cutting off the rope. It can be kind of confusing at first, but once you get familiar with it, um, you start to realize with the positioning, like, okay, if I do it right here, um, since I'm this close to the bottom ropes, the wrestler is going to move to the bottom rope. So why don't I just bring him forward a little bit or move him left a little bit and then, you know, he'll go in that direction of the ropes, which is what I need. And I'll be able to um, slap on the, the, the special and, and block the ropes. See, like right here is a perfect example. I'm blocking the ropes because, um, you know, my head is, is stuck in, in the ropes pretty much. It's, it's like it's kind of it's like a weird way of like. Um, working against the game, I think, or maybe not even working against the game, but you know, you you can't control as the person being submitted. You can't control in what direction you move towards the ropes, and I think that that would have been something I would have liked to see in like the next evolution of this series. I would have liked you be to be able to control the direction I move in when I have a submission applied. I mean, it doesn't really matter when you're playing against a computer opponent unless it's, you know, unless they're really difficult. But the computer never really tries to um, put you in submission moves unless it's their finisher in this game. But, you know, if you're playing against other people and they're trying to cut off the ropes from you, you should still have an opportunity to move to one of the other ropes to try to do a rope break. Because that would be more like, you know, actual wrestling. Like, you know, the ropes never really get cut off. By the wrestlers, there's there's always there's, it's a four you know there's four sides to the ring. There's always going to be another side they can walk to, um, and then maybe if you just get there in time, then you submit. I don't know, I, you know, I don't know how they would have worked it out, but I would have liked to seen that as opposed to being able to cut a guy off completely from the ropes and win, because when you're playing one on one, you know, or at least people used to get upset at me about it, <laughs> and you would cut them off from the ropes. It's like everyone would get upset. You know, it's no fair. I can't do the rope break because you always know how to um, cut me off from the ropes. It's like so. It would be great to have that opportunity um, to move to another part of the rope. Um, I think you could do it in the newer games. I think you can crawl to the other sides. Like in, in the newer games, I mean like the 2K games and like the SmackDown games. You know, the games that weren't developed by AKI, but. Um, you know the new WWE games. I think I think you were able to do it, but I'm, I don't remember. Uh, I didn't do really too much submission wrestling in the newer games. I don't know. I never I never liked the you know press the button rapidly to make the guy submit. Like don't don't make me exert all this energy <laughs> like just to just to build up the special meter or you know. I I was never a big fan of the tapping the button mechanic, which is why I love you know the the submission mechanic in this one because it's just you just slap on the, the submission and there you go you're wearing him down it's up to the other guy to break out why do i have to press you know the button rapidly i'm the one who was able to get the submission off anyway i was able to put him on the ground and throw a hold on him i shouldn't be the one putting in extra work he should you know like right like right now like you know if someone was playing as taka they should be trying to like desperately break out of the submission as opposed to me 
desperately trying to keep the submission on. So I never liked that they went in that direction with a lot of the newer games, how they wanted you to keep tapping A to like build up the submission and, and, and tap. Because if you, and especially like, it's frustrating because like, especially if you're in a long match, like, you know, I was playing, you know, 2K12, you know, a while ago, and, and if you're in a long match and you know that the guy, you've been working on the guy's leg all the time, like, you kind of just want to, like, you want it to be a, a, a victory that you can enjoy, not a victory that still requires a lot of, you know, all this excess energy. It's like, I, he should tap. I, I've damaged his leg enough, but you still want me to press this button rapidly, like, a thousand times? It's, 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 it's kind of tedious, you know, and counterintuitive, in my, in my opinion, because if someone's playing the game for the first time and they don't know that you do that, you know, they, they think, like, why is the submission hold keep breaking? Why, why are they not tapping out? Anyway, that's a little, uh, I, I digress, <laughs> talking about the, the different, like, little subtleties in the gameplay mechanics. But yeah, um, uh, so where were we? So he did No Way Out, uh, and then, um, so in between No Way Out and, um, WrestleMania 2000, um, that's when D. Malenko won the Light Heavyweight Championship, uh, and then at WrestleMania 2000, again, uh, it was too cool this time. Just Grandmaster Sexy and Scotty Tuhati and this and with China, and they took on Eddie Guerrero, Saturn, and Malenko, and a six-person you know mixed tag match, uh, and only mixed because China was in it. You know they always made an emphasis that oh this is a mixed match because it's a female wrestler, um, and that's around the time shortly after that Eddie Guerrero and China start having that uh, relationship on screen. So you saw really um, Saturn and Malenko team up a lot. Um, but then in Backlash, uh, the Backlash pay-per-view, D. Malenko um, took on Scotty Tuhati, defending the light heavyweight championship. Um, in Insurrection um, of May 2000, uh, you saw Too Cool again. Grandmaster Sexy and Scotty Tuhati beat Perry Saturn and D. Malenko. And this is where the Radicals started to um, break up that a lot of tension was in the group and um, so after that pay-per-view they didn't last too long you know Eddie Guerrero Saturn and Malenko had a falling out Benoit was already doing his own thing so he was kind of removed from the group anyway because um, he was like feuding with like Austin and The Rock and, and Stone Cold and Jericho um, but again WWE Network if you have it if there's one D Malenko match you have to watch um, of his time in WWE, you need to watch Judgment Day, May 21st, 2000. It's a triple threat match. Eddie Guerrero was the European champion. He put his title on the line against Saturn and Malenko. Talk about classic. You know, a classic match between these guys. They, they do it all in this match. And it's actually funny because I remember the match so vividly. And when I was doing research for this, it reminded me of it. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's right. They had that awesome triple threat match at, Inter at, um, at Judgment Day. And I remember being really into the match. And then when I rewatched the match on the network, the crowd wasn't as reactive as I thought they were. I don't know. They were kind of quiet. And there I go. I finally made someone tap, tap to the closer, Cloverleaf. Um, was able to still pull it off before my special went away. Uh, see, that was good positioning, too, because even if I got really close to the ropes, you could see my right leg would have blocked the ropes, but he didn't even make it that far. Taka didn't even have a chance to get that far, so I was able to put him away. Um, anyway, yeah, but watch that match, and, I mean, these guys put on a clinic. They, they do all, they, they're countering the crap out of each other, which was, which was great to watch because these guys know each other in and out, so it told a great story. Like, every little thing they were doing, they were countering each other. They did a, a lot of nice two-on-one spots. Um, very fast-paced match. Uh, it was non-stop, and um, they killed it. It was, a, it was a great match. It's one of my favorite matches that these guys did together because, again, you know, in, in 2001, you know, you saw both Saturn and Malenko, you know, leave. Malenko retired. Saturn just kind of disappeared. And Eddie Guerrero would leave too and then come back. So they never and, and they never really had an opportunity besides this year in 2000 to really, like, work with each other and wrestle each other a lot. Um, but this was, this was like their last great match together because... 
you know, you had those amazing series of matches in ECW between Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko. And then also in WCW, these, these guys fought each other all the time. Um, so, Judgment Day, May 2000, WWE Network. If you don't have it yet, get it, people. What's wrong with you? <laughs> Like, I just don't understand. Like, you go back and watch these, you know, matches as these, you know. I always say, you know, great matches don't stop being great, you know. So, even if you don't like the current, you know, WWE product, which is what a lot of people have told me. Like, oh, I don't want to get the network because I don't like the current product. You don't, you can't even watch the current product anyway besides the pay-per-views. Like, you can't watch Raw or SmackDown on it. You know, I watch Raw and SmackDown on Hulu. Um, and it's a cut show. It's you know it's an hour and a half each version, um, but also the current product to me right now is as NXT. <laughs> it's NXT and a lot of their specials like the Monday Night War, like a lot of the stuff they are doing currently that's not Raw and that's not SmackDown. I enjoy. I mean their pay per views have been pretty good last year. I would say better than they were the year before. Much better. And I think it's because they have the network. So now they know they gotta, you know, do things to keep people interested, to, to, to stay subscribed. But for me, the biggest thing about the network, when I saw that it was announced and they were, and they, you know, I thought it was gonna be a simple thing. I thought it was gonna be like, oh, we'll have some, you know, all the pay-per-views from WWF back in the day. I didn't think they were gonna include WCW, ECW, and all these other territories and classic matches and this and that. And then, and, and you could watch the pay-per-views live, you know, I the main reason why I have the network is to watch the classic matches is to watch the old matches because yeah when I watch raw and no one's wrestling I get tired of it but I can go on the network and and see what it used to be like <laughs> and see what wrestling used to be and, and hopefully one day it'll get back to that and you know but instead of like complaining that it's not the way it used to be like just go back and watch how it used to be and also like I haven't watched everything I've been a long time wrestling fan but there were a lot of years where I was removed from wrestling for whatever reasons. I wasn't catching up with it regularly. Um, or, or you know, there's a lot of stuff I don't remember that happened when I was a kid. A um, lot, of, lot of gaps in my memory. Um, especially with, like, Dean Malenko. Dean Malenko's a perfect example because I remember a lot of the stuff he did with Jericho. And a lot of the stuff he did with some of the other cruiserweights um, and I remember watching the stuff he did in ECW but there was there was a big time before his Jericho feud um, all the stuff he did in WCW I wasn't aware of a lot of matches I didn't know he had um, and it was great to see that it was great to see that on the network um, so yeah but you know this is a pretty more recent one this is only in May, in, in May of 2000 but it's the last great match that these guys did together and if you love their work you know, back in WCW and ECW, this was the match that basically said, hey, "All right, this is why these guys are here. This is why we brought these guys in because they can they can do a great like 15 minute match like this and have you engaged and tell a great story and and bring the intensity high up." Um, so yeah, Eddie, but Eddie Guerrero would maintain the European title against Saturn and Malenko. But watch that match; it's fantastic. I love it. It's one of my favorite matches, actually. It really is. You know, it, it, it stood out from the moment I saw it, when I saw it back in the day, and I never forgot that match. And not enough people talk about it, I think, because you never really hear about it, you know, that triple threat match they had. It was kind of under the radar, and, and that's kind of like the story of these guys, you know, at that time. You know, they were always kind of under the radar in WCW of how good they really were. But yeah, watch that match. Um, King of the Ring was the next pay-per-view. He wasn't there, D. Malenko. Uh, he lost his um, first round match to X-Pac, who I also have a run of uh, in my Let's Play series right before this one, actually. Um, so he didn't participate in King of the Ring. Uh, fully loaded. I cover this in my Crash Holly Let's Play. Uh, there was a Sunday Night Heat taping. See right there, real quick, Jeff Hardy, see how fast he tapped out. You didn't get that in Revenge. You didn't get them tap out so quickly like that. Like, watch. See, I like to call, I like to call them pulls when they do the submission hold how many times they pull back on the animation so you got one pull right there see how he goes back a little bit two pulls and then boom right there that's how you know they were pretty much at critical for their submission is when they do two pulls I think that's the fastest you can get them to submit I don't remember ever um, getting only one pull and then having the guy submit I think it takes two full pulls and then they submit right away 
I had been working on his leg, you know, throughout the whole match. So it was easy to get that at the end. And that's really that's really what you want to do. And it can be kind of difficult again because you don't want to make them tap accidentally when you're trying to work on their leg or their arm. You want you want to save it for the special. You know, you want him to win with the clover leaf. You know, that's his finisher. You want him to win with that. Um, a lot of the tricks I use, and you and you've seen them in this video if you've been watching, you know, me play, is I'll do the submissions on the outside. I'll get the guy on the outside so I can work on them on the outside because there is no rope break on the outside. So that's a great way to wear them down because you don't have a fear that they'll tap. I mean, ideally, you want to get them to tap outside because the great thing about No Mercy is that someone can tap and and not lose the match. That's when they go into the like the extreme danger, you know, meter. You know, when it goes purple, I, I think it just says like says danger, like extreme danger or something like that, or critical. Uh, maybe critical. I did it once in one of these other let's plays. I forgot who I did it to, but you can only get it one of two ways by either or three ways actually by knocking the guy out, by doing a knockout move, um, or or I guess only two ways by doing a knockout move or making them tap. But then you know by them tapping the match still doesn't end because you did it outside or you can't submit in the match rules or whatever. That's a great way to know. Okay, the next time I do a submission on him, he's going to tap. Because I've already made him tap. <laughs> so you could do that way too. You could just keep working on them on the outside. And see right here, um, I was going to go run outside against Christian, but I messed up. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's basically what I try to do. I try to get them on the outside so I can work on them outside. Um, especially if there is rope break. So that when I by the time I build up my special, they'll tap right away. Um... So yeah, that's another little tip on trying to put guys away e more easy in um, No Mercy. Alrighty, where, where was I? Okay, fully loaded. He was in the Sunday Night Heat taping with, with Crash Holly. He beat Crash Holly. He defended his light heavyweight title. And then Malenko, for some reason, wasn't on any of the next pay-per-views. He wasn't on SummerSlam, Unforgiven, or No Mercy. He was still rolling around. I don't know if, if you might remember, but he was like the ladies' man all of a sudden. Um, and, you know, he was accompanied by women to the ring. And he was being a very... He was a creep, you know. He was, being, he was a heel. So he was being a creep to a lot of the other female wrestlers. And actually challenging them to light heavyweight matches. Now... That time, during that time in the 2000s, I think that was like the best time for the women's division in wrestling. They had a lot of great female wrestlers. I mean, you had Lita, you had Trish, you had Molly Holly, you had Victoria. They were great to watch in the ring. You had Jacqueline. Um, and Dean Malenko wrestled them. And he put his light heavyweight championship on the line. And a lot of that happened on Heat. Uh, some of it happened on Raw, but a lot of it happened on Sunday Night Heat. And I remember those matches being fantastic. They were so good. And that's just a testament to how good both parties were. How good these female wrestlers were. And also how good Dean Malenko was. Because he really sold, you know, this this heel. Like, I'm such a douche guy in the ring. I'm wrestling a woman. And, you know, but these these women were able to come back and, you know, get some get some hits in, get some moves in, and those were some very entertaining matches. I, I, I'm waiting for when they put a lot of the Sunday Night Heat stuff on um, the WWE Network, because there were a lot of some, there were some gems on WW, uh, on Sunday Night Heat. You know, they put ECW TV, which is interesting, on the network, so I want to see them put Heat. And they've also, and I also want to see them put um, WCW Saturday Night. Because there was a lot of great cruiserweight stuff that happened on Saturday night in WCW that are kind of hard to find. A lot of special appearances. Liger was on there a, a bunch of times. Pillman. There was a lot of great matches that happened on Sunday, Saturday night. So yeah, there was a lot of great Deep Malenko stuff on Sunday Night Heat. And that's probably why you didn't see him on a lot of these pay-per-views. Because he, he was wrestling a little bit of a lighter schedule probably. They probably just didn't have enough for him marquee storyline wise to put him on the pay-per-views but survivor series 2000 getting to the end of it here um the radicals reunited previous like the month before and so did dx um as as good guys um 
And so you saw the Radicals take on DX, which was at this time Road Dog, K Quick, Billy Gunn, and China. And China and, and Guerrero had their falling out already, so that's why she's on the opposite team. And um, and the Radicals won; they beat them. So looking at that year, uh, you know, kind of a whirlwind for um, D Malenko. Probably not as crazy as like as like what Benoit was doing, um, but a lot of tag matches. And just him staying dominant as the light heavyweight champion. Now, you know, it's very interesting. He was, you know, champion pretty much this whole year. But um, he only had one pay-per-view championship match. The other one was a Sunday Night Heat taping. And again, that goes to show you that, you know, even though they gave Malenko the title and he was a well-deserved champion, um, you know, they weren't putting this title on the pay-per-view. Meanwhile, I remember in the WCW, and if you go back and you look at those old WCW pay-per-views, not only was there a Cruiserweight Championship match in pretty much every single one of them, but there was usually like two or three other Cruiserweight matches on the, on those cards. Um, because, you know, yeah, they might have never pushed these guys beyond that division, but at least they gave them airtime. And I think that was very important because... It stayed with a lot of people, and it definitely had an impact. I mean, anyone watching WCW growing up during the Attitude Era or the Monday Night Wars, whatever whatever you want to call that era, the NWO era, um, everyone remembers the Cruiserweight division. No one ever says, oh, yeah, that Cruiserweight division blew, didn't it? Like, no one says that. Like, if you say that, you'll get shunned. Like, people will look at you like you're crazy. And Dima Lincoln was a big part of that. And I feel like he could have been the veteran to help put a lot of guys over in the light heavyweight division. Uh, but instead, he was just a dominant champion. And I think that's because the light heavyweight division was so sparse. There really wasn't a lot of guys that he could build into stars and put over. Um, just because WWE he didn't have a well-developed light heavyweight division. But nonetheless... He still has the record, he still has the two reigns, and I'm sure he's happy doing whatever it is he's doing now. I, I think he works uh, with the WWE still, I think he does backstage stuff, uh, maybe some NXT development. I know I know. at one point he was a road agent, I don't know if he still is, but um, always enjoyed his matches. And um, yeah, I mean it was kind of bittersweet if you think about it because you look at his year, uh, he was only there for a year and a half pretty much. And it was so much hype, so much build up to the Radicals. And, you know, that first year and a half, two years that they were there, there, <laughs> that they were there, um, you know, they made a little bit of an impact. But it wasn't until, you know, when Chris Benoit got hurt and Guerrero got hurt, or actually when Guerrero got fired, and then Chris Benoit came back from his injury, and then Guerrero cleaned up his act and he came back. That's when those guys really took off and they became world champions. And it's tragic too because of what happened to them. So it was, it was, it's kind of a bittersweet looking back on the Radicals coming into the WWE because we were all so excited for them to come. Uh, but so many things, you know, time was against Steve Malenko's side. You know, he, 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 even before he came to WCW, the dude had so many years under his belt, you know, wrestling with his brother. You know, from the, from the Malenko, you know, heritage. This guy's been wrestling all his life. He was definitely a lot older than Guerrero and Benoit and Saturn. So, but I always enjoyed his work. And I'm glad to be finishing up the light heavyweight run with him. I'll probably be doing another WCW run as a, as a cruiserweight with D. Malenko. Or who knows, maybe I'll do a U.S. heavyweight run. Because he was U.S. Heavy, heavyweight champion very briefly. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. Maybe I'll do a U.S. heavyweight run with my Let's Play commentary. Uh, X-Pac is the perfect opponent to fight as D. Malenko because you can just counter his tick, his kicks all day. Uh, but here he goes, putting in some fight, countering, um, countering me, staying away from the the special. What I what I did miss that they took out of this game, and it was still in Virtual Pro Wrestling too. Um, which is why I was kind of shocked that they took it out. And there I go for a submission because I know he can break it, but I can at least get a few extra pulls to make sure that when I put the clover leaf on him, he'll tap out. But in Revenge, they had that move 
Especially if your guy was had a leg submission as like his trademark move, like Bret Hart or Di Malenko. Um, their their front special grapple was, you know, they pick you up and sort of like a sidewalk slam, I guess you could call it, and they'd slam you to the ground and then right away go into their leg submission, and that was really cool. And I thought that would have been cool to have in this game. Because it, it would make even more sense because then you'd go into your leg submission special and, you know, it would just be a lot easier to pull off. Kind of, kind of you know, disappointed as to why they took that out. Don't understand why they took it out. I never understood why some moves were removed or added um, when they were in the previous games. Um, the same thing with the mask. The creative mask feature that was in Virtual Pro Wrestling 2 that they took out of No Mercy. But I'll talk about more of that when I do Virtual Pro Wrestling 2. There's a lot more I gotta talk about. This is just the beginning. I hope you enjoyed watching this light heavyweight Let's Play. I hope you learned something. Uh, I hope you um, are excited about what's to come. Uh, if you have any comments of what you want to see, I've already had someone. Um, comment that they want to see me do a survival mode run um, which I will uh, they, you know they want me to do it as Taz and I'll totally do it as Taz I love Taz um, I tried it a little bit the other night did you know for the first time in years so that was fun but yeah if you want to see me do a certain wrestler or if you want me to do, to do a certain you know match or video I'm, I have created wrestler videos lined up I have special pay-per-view commentary kind of videos that I want to do. There's so many ideas I'm going to do, but most importantly, this 100% series is not complete. And I'm going to show you right now that the Light Heavyweight Championship is 100%, but I have all those other titles to go. World, Tag, Intercontinental, European, Hardcore, and Women's. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy this Let's Play series. It's the first of many. And remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And watch wrestling, subscribe to the WWE Network, and have a good time.